guys for coming out tonight. I am Michelle Rodriguez. I am the director of Hillsboro Empowers Youth. We are excited to be here. This is the first part of a three-part series on prescription drugs um, and the abuse by uh, youth and teens. We received a $5,000 grant from the American Medical Association Foundation, which is helping us do this, helping us record it um, and then air it live. So we're really excited about that. And it is it is increasing. We have two charts over there. I'd love for you to see if you haven't seen them. Those are Hillsboro specific. So that's Hillsboro specific um, middle school and Hillsboro specific high school on use of alcohol, marijuana, tobacco, and prescription drugs. And prescription drugs is going up. It has doubled in middle school. In five years, it is going up. Um, it is now at 8% in high school. It's at 6% in middle school. It jumped from three to now 6%. It's still the least drug used, but we're seeing it, and I'll allow um, Pat Hess, who is a student resource officer at um, the Hillsborough School District, talk about what they're seeing actually on campus, because we are seeing it more often. Um, the second part of our series is in March, and it will be from the eyes of the medical profession. Um, we have a pharmacist, we have a dentist, we have emergency room doctor, pediatrician, who are all sort of gonna talk about what they're seeing. And uh, that's in March, and we'll be also on the Tuality website if you want more information about that. And then in June, we're going to do a peer-to-peer -peer thing, and we're going to have the youth sort of talk about their experiences and talk to each other and try to um, have it youth-specific so that they can talk to their peers. But thank you again for being here. Um, because we're more of an intimate crowd, I think that we can also just have people ask questions directly if you have questions instead of writing them down. Either way, it doesn't matter. I just think it's makes it run smoother. Um, so we have tonight um, Pat Hess, as I said, he's from the um, Hillsborough Police Department. He's a student resource officer. We have um, Dave Morris, who is a drug recognition expert, and he's also an officer with the Hillsborough Police Department, and Julie McLeod, who is a crime prevention specialist with the Washington County off Sheriff's Office. Woo, just went blank. Um, and the last announcement that I have is we have a prescription drug turn-in event on Saturday. We have signs all over Hillsborough. Uh, if you have any prescription drugs, over-the-counter drugs, anything you want to turn in that's used, um, that you're not using anymore, that's expired, please come and drop them off. And luckily, we are going to have a permanent drop box at the Sheriff's Office, actually, that will be open year-round, so that's really exciting as well. So thank you guys for coming. I'm going to hand it over to Pat. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here tonight, and uh, hello to our television audience. Uh, great to have you here tonight, and, and uh, I'm actually honored to be with two of my peers, Julie, have worked with us for a long time, and Dave also, and uh, Dave is a drug recognition expert, which you'll hear quite a bit from, and I'm a little jealous, as I told Dave, because many years ago, I wanted to be a DRE, drug recognition expert, and there was this belief back in about 1989, 1990, that, nah, we really didn't need one of those. Okay, well we do. And it's a very important skill that Dave brings to the table and one we rely on a lot. But we're gonna kinda get you to be drug recognition experts tonight. Um, I do notice I have two hecklers in the audience. I don't know about everybody else there, but you two, just be careful, okay? Um, I wanna start with just a simple statement. What we do not condemn, we condone. And as any of us, our parents know, if our kids keep doing the same thing over and over again, and it's not the behavior that we want, if we don't correct it, it continues. The same thing apps in, in working in the schools when we, when we try to build a culture or a climate of safety and, and, uh, good, and a good educational process in the schools, we need to get that built into our kids' heads. That's the way we should do it. And it will carry on um, as adults and create successful adults. And that's our job in the schools. I specifically work at Brown Middle School and Century High School, and I spend a lot of time in the classroom. And I tell kids I don't have to make up stories because you kids give them to me all the time. I've got two new ones today that I'll be able to use. Just when kids making choices that aren't maybe the best. So the one thing is we really need to remember is when we see something that's not right, we've got to change it. And that's one of the reasons we're here tonight is to give you some information on what's going on in our community as far as drugs, and then you can in turn help fix that. So I'm going to start with a little uh, drug jeopardy. So we'll take drug use for $100, Alex. 
<laughs> and the answer is 1979. The question is, what year was the highest recorded percentage of illicit drug use by change in the United States? 1979. We're considerably lower than we were in 1979, but we're still very high. <clears throat> I think 1979 is a big year because 1980 is when a third grader in an elementary school in California asked Nancy Reagan, what if somebody offers me drugs? And Bless her, pee pick and heart, Nancy Reagan said, just say no. <laughs> hey, it worked for me. It did. But that started a firestorm. That started thing, it, society just went nuts over that. Because people go, yay, Nancy, way to go. Thanks for saying that. It needed to be said. There's other people going, oh, that isn't going to work. You have to do this. And somebody said, no, 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 we've got to do this. Pretty quick, we've got 50,000 different drug abuse programs going on. The federal government's handing out money like it's candy. And we drop considerably in the drug use. And you can see it by the chart. In the year 1990, 1991 was the lowest rate. And you'll notice that the red line on the graph was 12th grade, the blue line is 10th grade, and the green line is 8th grade. And in 1975, monitoringthefuture.org started doing these surveys. Um, they continued to do, us, do them. In 1990, they started with the 10th and the eighth grade during surveys, and it was great. So just that one simple just say no message started a firestorm that dropped our drug use by teens tremendously. A couple other things happened in about 1991 that took us off that message, and it started to climb again. And we showed, showed a drop in about 2004, 2005, but as you can see, since about 2007 or 2008, we're back on an upswing and trends say that it's continuing to be that way for the next couple of years. <clears throat> so let's talk about this is seniors in high school, marijuana use in the past 30 days. That are seniors in high school that have used marijuana in the past 30 days. According to monitoringthefuture.org, 21.4% of our seniors. In Washington County, it's 22.8%. Let's go to ninth graders though. And this, this number should be shocking to you. Again, in the past 30 days, who's used marijuana? In the United States, 8%. Washington County, 12.5%. That is a huge increase. A 50%, we have a 50% higher average than in the United States in marijuana use by our eighth graders from last year. That is a scary, scary percentage. In other words, what's the number? And the answer, another uh, Jeopardy question, the answer is 1 in 78. 1 in 78 is the number of adults in Washington County registered in the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program. We are here most specifically to talk about prescription drugs. Marijuana is a prescription drug in Oregon. And it's being abused by our kids. And it is very available. And they're getting the marijuana now exactly the same way they're getting their Oxycontin and their Vicodin and their Percocet. They're getting it from home. Just facts. So let's talk about 30-day drug use. Um, and, it, and this is in a local high school. Michelle gave us the figures from the Hillsborough School District altogether. This is just from Century High School. This is, this is data from Century High School. And as you can see, alcohol use by um, 11th graders at Century High School, 24.8%. Nationally, the average is 42%. We're doing pretty good there. The next most widely abused drug is marijuana. 23% in Century High School by seniors, 21.4% in the United States. We're high. Cigarettes, 14.2 compared to 19.2. Our kids aren't smoking. Why? Because they've been growing into their heads since they're three years old, smoking can kill you. Smoking is going to cause cancer. You get all things bad kinds of things are going to happen when you're smoking cigarettes. That's exactly the same message we've got to get about these other drugs. Prescription drug use. One, two, three, number four on the list. 5.8% of Century High School for the seniors, of this year's seniors, 5.9% nationally. Pretty much the national average. Uh, have, did you ever think that we would be talking about heroin use in our high schools? 
This is an alarming figure. 3.4 percent of this year's seniors at Century High School have reported using heroin. When I was in high school, we, heroin was a drug that the junkies down in Haight Ashbury in San Francisco were shooting into their veins while they were singing with, with whoever the latest, you know, Bob Dylan or whoever it was. Nothing to do with us. Now we have high school seniors at a rate of 5.8 percent. I'm sorry, 3.4 percent. Ecstasy, 3.2 percent at Century High School and nationally 1.4 percent because of a, we're just going to be seeing that number rise because of a little factor we call generational forgetting. Ecstasy was huge in the 90s, big in the 90s. People started saying, ah, not so good, we're going to quit using ecstasy. Well, those kids are gone. We've got a new group of kids coming up. Ecstasy is still around. They don't remember all the bad stories, so I think we're going to see use go up. Uh, cocaine, same deal. LSD, 2.8% of our kids are using LSD of our seniors. Again, generational forgetting. The dopers quit using acid in the 60s because it was killing everybody. They were jumping off buildings and trying to fly through freight trains going down the road and started killing. So they said, whoa, enough of this. The high school kids have not seen that. They've not lived through that. They don't know those stories. It's coming back. We did a great job on methamphetamines. 2.1%, one of the least abused drugs we have right now. And a lot of that, and I'll credit Julie for that, especially in Washington County, is a huge, huge push we made in the early 2000s about meth use. Be careful of that number, though, ladies and gentlemen, because meth will be coming back. The two biggest ones here we really have to worry about ecstasy and meth on the, uh, the illicit drugs. And of course, we're specifically going to talk a lot about prescription meth tonight. But these are true numbers, ladies and gentlemen. And although they're alarming, also keep in perspective that most kids aren't using. That's something we tend to forget sometimes. We've got to remember the kids who aren't using and being the, the proper role model. <clears throat> so where are these darn kids getting this stuff? And specifically, we're talking more here about the prescription meds and marijuana. Their peers are giving it to them. I didn't say friends, I said peers. Because peers, your peers aren't necessarily your friends. Peers sell it to them. I had some leftovers, uh, especially with prescription meds. Uh, your son or daughter breaks their arm, rollerblade, and playing football or something. You've got some Viking or something for the pain. Hey, that felt pretty good. I got five left in the bottle, don't need them anymore. I'll just put them aside until I need them. Hey, you know, things aren't going too good. That bike had made me feel pretty sharp. Maybe I'll take one. My mom, dad, sister, brother, grandma, grandpa had some leftovers. I would have been the medical cabinet. I stole them from a pair. Had a case like this last spring at the drama school. <clears throat> some Vicodin showed up at school. We caught it right away. Uh, found out, traced it back to a young lad who went, kept going to friends' homes. Knocking on the door, hey, hey, can I use your bathroom? I, I gotta go to the bathroom. I ain't gonna make it home. Yeah, 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 sure, come on in. Well, while I was in the bathroom, we'd look into the medicine cabinet. And it's given filled out of his peers, folks, medicine cabinet. That's where they came from that day. I took them from my mom, dad, and sister. Maybe you've got a prescription laying around the house. They skim one, two, three pills at a time. You get another refill, they take a couple out of there, and they've got it. Why? Why are we seeing this increase, especially with our kids? And this is a quote from the 2010 Monitoring the Future Drug Survey. The increases in youth, in youth drug use reflected in the survey are disappointing. Mixed messages about drug legalization, particularly marijuana, may be to blame. Let's look at our society right now. Marijuana is condoned in society. You can't turn on the television without seeing an ad for 50,000 different prescription medications. How many times do we go to the doctor and the doctor said, here, just take this pill, you'll be fine. It's normal. And when prescribed appropriately and used appropriately, prescription drugs are great. But we've got to watch the message that we're sending to our kids. And we've got to be careful about that and make sure that uh, it's a safe one and they're using only what they're supposed to use and that we're keeping the other stuff locked up. But we'll get to a little more about that later. But the big message here, ladies and gentlemen, is an issue. 
It really is. And you know, 30 years ago when I started doing public presentations like this, my boss has always told me, no, 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 don't make it a big deal. It's not, burglary is okay, don't do that. Don't talk about drugs. It didn't do us any good. So now I've actually got two cops and a, and a you know, few weeks from the sheriff's office to say, yeah, this is an issue, folks, and we need to fix it. So before I get the hook, which is going to come, I can see, I want to stop here and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dave Morse. And Dave's going to talk about uh, the actual effects of the drugs and uh, some of his experiences on the street. All right, thanks, Pat. Uh, before we get started a little bit, I need to, need to make a couple things clear. Um, I'm not just here as a police officer. I was born and raised in Hillsboro. It, over the long time that I've lived here, uh, I've chosen this as the place to raise my family. I have kids that are in the high schools here. I have kids, I have one in middle school and I still have one in grade school. Um, this is important to me. Um, what I'm going to do is make sure that everybody understands what a drug recognition expert is, why they asked me to come speak. I want to make sure that you understand kind of the drug categories that are out there specifically rated, uh, related to prescription medications. And I want to give you what some of the signs and symptoms are that you can look for to kind of help um, get a better idea of what's going on. I would just encourage you to not be like the ostrich that puts your head in the sand, okay? I, have, I know kids in high school. I see my children's friends. I see my own children, and I look at them differently because I see what's going on around us. Um, I've been a, uh, in police work for about eight years. I was a reserve officer in Hillsboro for two years, and I've been full-time for a little over six years. Uh, last year, an opportunity came up to apply to be a drug recognition expert. Um, the drug recognition program actually started in the 1970s down in California. They had some police officers that were arresting people for drunk driving. They'd take them back to the, they'd do their field sobriety tests, they would take them back to the police department, and they would actually have no alcohol in their systems. And so they went on, uh, exercised a lot of initiative, and started this program of being able to find other things that would explain why people are so impaired. So that's basically what a drug recognition, recognition expert is used for. Um, when somebody goes, uh, when someone gets arrested for drunk driving, when they perform poorly, poorly on the field sobriety tests, and they blow less than the legal limit, or the impairment that the officer sees does not match the result on their breath test, I get a phone call. Um, I'm specially trained to do some other tests uh, to detect the signs and symptoms of impairment. Um, it's kind of interesting because I walk into the jail and most police officers come with badges. They come with the Batman <coughs> belt. Uh, when I come into the jail, I come in with a stethoscope. I come in with a blood pressure cuff. I come in with a thermometer. I come in with little fancy flashlights. And I tell you, hey, I'm going to shine this light in your eyes and see what your pupils do. Um, to become a drug recognition expert, it's a competitive process. There's not very many in the state of Oregon. I think we're getting close to 200 with this last class that graduated a couple weeks ago. Um, we spend two full classroom weeks uh, learning about signs and symptoms, and then we spend four days uh, testing volunteers that are under the influence of different type of drugs, practicing our skills. There is a systematic and a standardized protocol that we follow. It's a 12-step protocol. Um, it may be hard to see up here, but the first the first one is we have to get a breath test before we can get involved. Uh, we interview the arresting officer and see the things that they saw. Um, we also do a preliminary examination or a chat with the individual. We look at their eyes. We see if we can detect an odor of anything on their breath. We look at how they're acting. Um, we'll take pulses, and we spend a lot of time working with people's eyes. Um, we do, I don't know if you've ever seen field sobriety tests where an officer will stand on the side of the road and he'll move a pen or his finger back and forth. What we're doing right there is looking for some involuntary jerking of the eyes. It's a big fancy word, it's called nystagmus. That is indicative, if we see that in people, that's indicative that they're under certain categories of, uh, they're under the influence of certain types of drugs. Um, we also do things like the one leg stand, the walk and turn, the Romberg balance test. These are all what we call a psychomotor test. 
they have us do something physically while we have to remember because basically this is designed for driving. So driving requires you to do a lot of things all at once. When you're impaired, it makes it more difficult to do that. Um, we also do, we do blood pressure, like I said, and then we go to a dark room and we spend a lot of time looking at people's eyes. We measure the size of their pupils in three different lighting conditions, room light, near total darkness, and then in direct light. And based on how those pupils react, we can make some determinations on what kind of drug categories they might be under the influence of. Uh, we also check their muscle, muscle tone. We'll grab their arms. We'll say, hey, how's your arms feel? Sometimes you feel rubbery. That's called flaccid muscle tone. Sometimes it feels like they're flexing. That's rigid muscle tone. Sometimes it's kind of normal. We call that normal muscle tone. Uh, different drugs affect our bodies different ways. Once we get through that, I use what's called the matrix. Not like the movie matrix, but it talks about, it talks about the eyes. We're looking for nystagmus. We're looking for lack of convergence. We talk about pupil size, how it reacts to light. And then we get into things like their pulse, their blood pressure, what their body temperature is doing. What we're gonna do today is talk about the seven basic drug categories that we use in the DRE program. Some of them don't really apply to prescription medications, so we're gonna just touch on them quickly. And then we're, uh, we're gonna talk about some of the popular ones or ones that you may see out or, or may have heard of or may even have in your own home that you don't recognize, realize fall into these categories. Um, the first category is a central nervous system depressant. Does anybody wanna take a guess at what the most common central nervous system depressant is? Yes, ma'am. Alcohol. Alcohol is a central nervous system depressant. Just like the name implies, it slows down your body's function. How many people have ever seen somebody that's drunk? Everybody's seen that. And if you haven't seen it in real life, you've seen it on TV. Um, it slows down your brain functions. Some of the other ones that you might, reali might not realize that are actually central nervous system depressants. Anybody heard of a little drug um, called Xanax? What about Prozac? Ambien? Anyone? Lunesta? These are all central nervous system depressants. That why they put you, that's why they put you to sleep. There's basically six subcategories besides the alcohol. You've got barbiturates. So if you ever hear anything with the barbitol at the end, cecobarbital, phenobarbital, those are um, barbiturates. They've got non-barbiturates. Uh, Ambien's one of those, Soma, Lunesta. You've got your anti-anxiety tranquilizers, your Xanax, Klonopin, Valium, um, Rohypnol, Ativan, things like that. Uh, next, you've got antidepressants. That's where you get your Prozac, your Zoloft, things of that nature. You've got antipsychotic tranquilizers, things like um, Heloperidol. Whenever you're getting mad in the hospital and stuff, that's the thing they show with the injection where they just jam it in you and go whoosh, Haldol. That calms people down really well. Um, there's also, also Thorazine. That's a really heavy duty antipsychotic tranquilizer. Um, I've heard that referred to as a liquid lobotomy um, because it calms you down extremely quickly to the point that you um, operate very slow and are easily controlled. And then they've got combinations of different types of those things that they also use in those areas. Um, the next category we're gonna talk about is central nervous system stimulants. Uh, there's basically three subcategories. There's cocaine there's amphetamines, and then there's everything else. Now there are some medical applications uh, for amphetamines, uh, things like uh, ADHD treatment. It's funny because things like Ritalin and Adderall, those are actually stimulants, but when you give them to somebody that has ADHD, it has a calming effect. It's kind of counterintuitive. Um, some of the drugs, uh, the Ritalin, the Adderall, even things like ephedrine you find in lots of health food supplements, and there's even caffeine. Caffeine's a stimulant. Just as an aside, if you ever look at the chemical formulation for caffeine and you look at the chemical formulation for cocaine, they're super, super similar. Um, the next one is a hallucinogen. Things like LSD, your magic mushrooms. Ecstasy, we categorize as a hallucinogen. Even though the last little bit of MDMA, which is the technical acronym for ecstasy, the last A is for amphetamine. We call it a psychedelic amphetamine. The other one is a dissociative anesthetic, things like PCP, ketamine. They're basically animal tranquilizers. The thing that's really interesting that I found um, surprising as I 
started getting more into figuring out why people were impaired when they weren't necessarily drunk. Dextromethorphan. Has anybody ever heard of that? Anybody got any of that laying around in the house? It's in cough syrup. You know, you take enough dextromethorphan, you can have those same kind of effects as PCP and ketamine has. Uh, next, there's narcotic analgesics. All right, these are basically all derivatives of opium, and they make pain go away. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about that, and Julie's got a great presentation. There's also inhalants. These are things that people huff. The last one is cannabis. That's a big fancy word for marijuana. So what we're going to do is go through uh, and discuss the symptoms and general indicators that you can look for in each of these categories. A couple things you need to remember, though. Um, these indicators don't mean that, oh, this is for sure what it is, all right? Um, there's going to be variations because people are going to have different dosages. They're going to react differently to these type of things. And drugs are going to interact differently with each other. Um, one of the other things that we need to remember, this is where they gave me the pens for. When we take substances in, well, at, at all times, our body is looking to maintain a level balance, and that's called homeostasis. So I'm going to put my fancy handwriting up and write down homeostasis for you. All right, homeostasis. Our body is going to do whatever it has to do with the natural hormones and chemicals that it produces on its own to make sure that we stay on a relatively calm playing field. All right, this is what your body fights to do. For example, if I take a depressant, do you think it's going to make my body work faster or slower? Anyone? Depressant. Slower. So that substance is going to bring me down just like this. So what's my body going to try to do? It's going to want to get me back to homeostasis. So it starts dumping things that stimulate me. So eventually those effects wear off, but guess what? The body is still dumping those chemicals in. And so we actually end up going, well, not really that high, but we end up going above the line. And so for a while, we actually have the opposite effect or a downside effect. Let's switch colors. Let's ask the other question. What happens if I take a stimulant? What's that going to do to my body? Is it above the line or below the line? It's going to be above the line. So it's going to jack my body up. But as that effect starts to wear off, my body's going to start trying to bring it back down. And so after that stimulant wears off, I'm actually going to have, again, the downside effect. So it's not even though I'm still, sort of, I'm still experiencing the side effect of my stimulant, it actually looks more like I'm experiencing the depressant until my body can bring me back up to normal. So homeostasis is an important thing that we need to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing that we need to remember, especially with poly drug use, um, very rarely does somebody use just one type of drug. Um, in all the evaluations that I've done in training out and out on the street, there has been one person that has used just one drug. And we're still waiting for a urine sample to come back on that so we don't know for sure yet. Um, there's four of them. The first one is a null effect. If there's one of those indicators that is not affected by one drug category and it's not affected by the other drug category, I'm not going to see anything in that drug category. Nothing plus nothing equals nothing. We have overlapping effects where one drug category will affect a certain indicator and the other drug category won't affect that same indicator. So when I do my evaluation, I'm going to expect to see the indicator from that one drug. There's also the additive effect. If one drug affects the same cate affects category A, the drug B affects that same category, I'm going to see that and because it's the same thing, it might be even more exacerbated. It might be easier to see. And then the last one is the antagonistic effect. One indicator, or one drug's going to affect it this way, the other drug's going to affect it the other way. There's really no way for us to tell what's going to manifest itself. It's going to depend on dosage, individual reactions, the strength of what they're taking, um, their tolerance to these substances. It gets kind of crazy. Now this is fairly easy because we've got a one plus one equals something. What happens when we get three drug categories in there? We get one that affects it, one that doesn't and another one that makes it go down. It gets a little bit convoluted. So there's a little bit of, uh, you have to look at the totality of your circumstances before you make a guess on what they've got. All right, 
central nervous system depressants. Again, we talked about what some of these were. Does anybody want to raise their hand and shout out what a central nervous system depressant is besides alcohol that we mentioned? Anyone? Bueller. <laughs> what? Xanax. Xanax, yeah. So these are antidepressants, things like that. They're going to be disoriented. All right, they're going to have droopy eyelids. They're going to behave kind of like they're drunk. Their muscle tone is going to be very relaxed. It'll be flaccid. Gait ataxia, that's just a $10 word that means they can't walk. They're having some balance problems. Their reactions are going to be slow. So if you want to play catch with them, that might be kind of fun. Just use a smush ball or something because they're going to miss it. Um, their speech is going to be thick. It's like their tongue gets fat almost. They're going to slur their words. And they're going to be basically uncoordinated. Is there any questions about depressants really quick before we go on? All right. The next one is stimulants. There's a lot of things that um, can indicate somebody's under the influence of stimulants. Um, has anybody ever seen the faces of meth pictures that they had from Multnomah County? All right. Um, it's very interesting to sit with somebody or see somebody that's in the middle of experiencing the full effects. I'll call it what it is. They're in full on tweak mode. They can't sit still. They're shaking. They have white dried spittle on the corners of their mouth because their mouth gets dry. Um, they're feeling really good. Uh, where somebody might use some motions when they're talking, somebody that's under the influence of meth or a stimulant, not just meth, is going to be flinging their arms around and they're going to be loud. They're going to be fluctuating their volume. They grind their teeth a lot. It's called bruxism. Um, their eyelids will be, when the, if their eyes are closed, their eyelids will actually flutter so much so. One of the tests we do is called the Romberg balance test. We have them stand with their feet together, hands down at their sides. We have them tilt their head back, close their eyes, and estimate the passage of 30 seconds. While they're doing that, they're going to sway back and forth, and their eyelids will be flickering so hard. You could see whites in their eyes. Um, the other thing that they do is they have a really bad perception of time. You say, estimate 30 seconds. So they'll go like this. Done. Well, how'd you get there? I counted to 36 times, and then I waited a little bit before I told you because I wanted to make sure I wasn't counting too fast. These are actual responses. Somebody that's under depressants, they'll, we stop the test after 90 seconds, but they're there they're just standing there having a good old time. Yeah, everything's good. And it's like, hello, are you still awake? Um, they're going to be, they're going to have a lot of increased alertness because like I said, it's a stimulant. They're jacked up so they can't sleep. They have insomnia. And when you don't sleep, what happens to you? You get irritable. Um, if they're snorting these type of things, you're going to see redness around their nose. They'll be red, uh, around their nasal cavity. The hair inside their nose can be gone because these little crystals are kind of sharp. So they'll actually take care of trimming nose hairs for you. Um, they're going to have runny noses if they're snorting those type of things. They won't be quiet. And they're going to have very rigid muscle tone. It's almost like they're trying to flex. Um, you'll see their hands fidgeting. Their legs will bounce. They just cannot stay still. Um, questions about stimulants? Ritalin, Adderall, methamphetamine, regular amphetamine. These are all things that kids have access to fairly easily. Even when Desperate Housewives came back, the mom that had the crazy twins, she started taking her kids ADHD medication, Ritalin, I think, so she could have enough energy to do everything that she wanted to do. All right, well, we're gonna skip over to dissociative anesthetics. Um, PCP is kind of the big one that we, uh, that we talk about a lot. In fact, the category used to be called PCP. Um, there's a couple things about PCP that are a good clue. When we look at people's eyes and look for that nystagmus, the first thing we do is we hold the stimulus up and see if they can watch it. Somebody that's under the influence of PCP, is their eyes won't be able to stay in one spot. They'll just be flickering back and forth. The other indicator with PCP is that it causes your body temperature to go up so much. Usually if you're on PCP, you're in some state of undress. Um, a lot of times there's people that are fully, fully nude with PCP. I haven't seen that. Um, there are officers around that have, and it can be quite interesting because the associative anesthetics, they kind of they basically, from here down, you don't know what's going on. So you have increased pain thresholds. They can be violent. They have rigid muscle tone. Their behavior goes up and down. They can't talk. When they do talk, it'll be gibberish. Um, we've seen, there, if we had more time, I could show you videos of people that are under the influence of PCP. 
Um, it's hard to see them because there's four or five cops sitting on them trying to hold them down so they can get medical attention. But they're talking about things that make absolutely no sense. Um, they're going to have hallucinations. That's why they try to do things like fly through walls and jump out of windows. Um, they also do moonwalking. I don't mean Michael Jackson moonwalking, but they kind of walk really slow like they're trying to sneak and tippy toe. That's what we mean by moonwalking that way. Um, they are going to have some distortions in the things that they're hearing around them. They aren't going to see or feel things the way that they normally would. Uh, next one we'll talk about is narcotic analgesics. These are our painkillers. We joke about these a lot. How many of you have ever been to the dentist and got a little Vicodin afterwards? Yeah. Oh, I sprained my leg. Here's some Vicodin. Mm. Vicodin, Demerol, Percocet, Darvocet, morphine, heroin, Oxycontin, Oxycodone, Codeine. All these things are opium derivatives. Those little silly plants that grow over in Asia. That's where all this stuff comes from. Um, the one giveaway for somebody that's under the influence of a narcotic analgesic is the size of their pupils. They will be tiny. They'll be super tiny and they will not react to light. Um, it's the only drug category we talk about that actually causes pupils to constrict. Um, sometimes, depending on the type of depressant, some of them will, cons well, some of them will dilate. Uh, if you're talking about a stimulant, your pupils are going to be blown wide open. But narcotic analgesics are screwed down tight. One of the, when we test in the dark room, we use what's called a pupilometer. All these little dots are precisely measured, and it goes anywhere from super, super small to great big. I've seen people on stimulants that their pupils are bigger than this. I've seen people under the influence of narcotic analgesics that have pupils kind of somewhere up in this, in this area. What's funny is when I'm measuring this, the last one I do, I'm actually shining a medical light right in your eyeball. And they don't move at all. There's absolutely no reaction. So that's one dead giveaway. Um, their reflexes are going to be depressed. Blood pressure is going to go down. Pulse rate is going to go down. Their respiratory rates are going to go down. They're going to look like they're what we call on the nod. They'll be standing there talking to you, and their eyelids will droop, and they'll go. And they're totally coherent of what's going on. So you'll be like, hey, Dave, wake up. Yeah, I'm fine. Their speech is slow. It's raspy. If you go on the Internet sometime, like on YouTube, and type in on the nod, there's pictures of people sitting in the park trying to eat their yogurt. Uh, two weeks ago in Costco with my wife, a lady trying to drink a latte. And my wife was like, I think she needs help. I'm like, honey, she's narcotic analgesic. She's probably on heroin. I mean, this is stuff that we see all the time. Um, they also have really slow, low, raspy speech. The first time I saw somebody that was having almost a heroin overdose, I, I actually thought that they'd been assaulted and beat up and had a head injury because they were talking so quietly. And this is somebody that I'd seen full on in the middle of stimulant effects when they can't sit still they're jumping up and down things like that it was really kind of weird the first time until i realized ah this is not a stimulant this is a narcotic analgesic um the other thing you're going to see is a lot of itching they don't want to scratch their hands they want to scratch their faces all right and the last one is cannabis cannabis marijuana is the ranch dressing of drugs um, it's readily available especially in oregon and people use it all the time with everything else. Um, if you want to know what somebody under the influence of marijuana looks like, I'd check out Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Dazed and confused, half-baked, because they have fairly accurate representations. Um, they have really, really red bloodshot eyes. This fancy word over here that I'm going to point out with the laser pointer, conjunctive. That's another fancy word for the inside lining of your eye, and it kind of hooks up to the white part. That gets super, super red. Um, they're going to have an impaired perception of time and distance. They're going to have relaxed inhibitions. The thing that's funny is on the outside, they're all relaxed. Yeah, everything is good. But guess what? Your pulse rate's going to be up, and your blood pressure's going to be up. No, man, I'm good. It's relaxing me then why is your pulse 120 and why is your blood pressure 200 over 110? It's a little bit outside the range of the norms. Um, there's also an increase in appetite. 
a lot of times people will start getting a little paranoid. Um, that gets, we had a uh, situation a couple weeks ago with somebody that was, had been smoking some marijuana that decided it would be a good idea to pull his gun out at the guy that he thought was yelling at him. And his perception of what this man looked like was absolutely incorrect. He was bigger than me, he was gonna hurt me. Well, he was about this much shorter than the guy. So, um, paranoia can be really scary. Uh, does anybody have any questions about these things? Yes, ma'am. Going back to the disassociative. Um, yes. Is DXM, a lot of the kids I see are using DXM. Yes. The effects are like the one you described for TCP. Yes, but they aren't quite as severe. You have to take a lot of dextromethorphan to get those kind of effects. But the ones I would look for are the increase in the temperature and the, the whole, the blank, excuse me, let's go back to the right slide. There we go. Um, the difficulty with speech. Those are kind of the ones that I would look for first. Chances are they won't be violent. That's kind of more of specifically a PCP thing. But if you see somebody that's exhibiting those things and they're wanting to take their clothes off, it's time to get a lot of help. All right, any other questions? Yes, sir. I, yeah, I had a question about marijuana, actually. Okay. Um, kind of a two-part question. In regards to marijuana, can you address the increased THC content of today's marijuana to, to your dad's marijuana? And, and is it, in, if we, we hear a lot of it's natural. Well, if you really believe that marijuana is natural anymore, you are sadly mistaken. The, the chemical in marijuana that we look at is called delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. It's THC. So THC content that you have in marijuana today is exponentially greater than marijuana from, say, back in the 60s. Um, I've never used marijuana. As I've talked to people that have, they're like, this is not the weed we were smoking behind the gym in high school. This is totally different. There is a whole industry with hydroponics and crossbreeding. Um, that's a big money-making industry, even though prescription uh, medical marijuana is a nonprofit thing in the state of Oregon. That's the requirement. You can't make money on it. You can just be reimbursed. Um, the science behind crossbreeding and hybridization uh, is amazing. There's marijuana that we can find in cars and in bags. We process it and we put it in a paper bag and we tape that paper bag shut after we weigh it. We'll put it into our evidence lockers and you can smell it throughout the entire police precinct. The, it, it's super strong. One of the questions I ask people, it's like, hey, this marijuana that you said you used, was it good stuff? He's like, one guy's like, it's the best. The best I've ever had. I'm like, on a scale of one to 10, what do you think? He's like, like a 9.5. Some people are like, nah, nah, nah it's all right. Um, one of the, if you can smell it really easily, I think the more you smell, the more that, that smell is evident, I think the higher THC content that there is. Uh, that's not scientific, that's just, if it's super stinky weed, it's usually pretty powerful stuff. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I just, we just hear a lot how, how it is natural, and, and yeah, exactly. Well, hydroponics and the, the, the natural part is just, it's kind of gone. Anymore. Well, technically speaking, there's a lot of opium derivatives that are natural too, you know, but they've taken opioids where they're starting to manufacture things. You've got things like methadone that mimic that. You know, there's three things that every narcotic is going to do for you. It's going to relieve pain. It's going to cause you to have withdrawal sy symptoms and those symptoms are mitigated by taking some other form of a narcotic analgesic, every one of them. Now there's some that are straight natural, you know, morphine, things like that. There's things that are more, there's alkaloids, there's derivatives, there's semi-synthetics, there's full synthetics. So that's a little bit, I think um, Julie's gonna talk about that in a little bit. Is there any other questions? Anyone, Steve, anything? <laughs> All right, um, yes. Yes. Um, well, I don't know. Do you want to speak more to that as far as is how? I can feel that. Yeah. yeah. Um, as kids, there's a couple parts of your brain that are really developing now, and that's your prefrontal cortex, that's the front part of your brain that it's basically your judgment part, so one helps you make decisions. And the other is your hippocampus, which is your memory center. Okay, those are your 13, 14? 
Oh, 16, I'm sorry. It's the code. But those are the two parts of your brain that are really developing now. The THC and the marijuana and the other chemicals actually slow or stop the development of those two parts of your brain. So you've automatically got a judgment issue and, and a memory issue. The, as far as the long-term effects, um, since marijuana is smoked, you're going to see some of the same effects as smoking tobacco. So there's an increased risk of cancer, oral cancer, lung cancer. You're still sucking in the same chemicals as you would a cigarette. Carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, the tar, the nicotine. And, you know, so you've got those in your upper respiratory system. There's a lot of, there's, over the last probably 10 to 15 years, there's more and more scientific studies into marijuana that are suggesting there are a number of issues damaging your, your um, again, this is research, but there could be damage to your genes. So you might make it out okay, but your kids might not be because of damage to your genes from the, from the marijuana. That, that's, that's research from, from several years ago that's, that's still kind of out there and they're working on. So to answer your question, can it affect you? Absolutely. Can I give you a specific answer of what it is? No. But I do know at 13, 14, 15, you start smoking it, you're going to be a Spicoli. And that goes back to that. Yeah, that's a great question. Another aspect, too, if I can jump in here, is not necessarily the physical effects, but if you just look at life choices that people make um, when they are heavily involved with marijuana, um, it's actually called a motivational syndrome. You know, you might have all kinds of hopes and dreams and plans for your future, but it really tends to dull your motivation, and so people don't apply themselves in school. A lot of times, they tend to drop out. You know, end up playing video games in in their mom's basement. You know, they just really have a hard time with their socialization and also achieving their goals. Kind of go back to your question. Did, did Purely natural marijuana is one to three percent THC content. We're seeing stuff on the street that's over thirty. Well, not not around here, but the high twenties. Dave, probably. There's, uh, I think the highest they talked about measuring. Don't quote me on this. Was thirty seven? Thirty seven percent, and that's yeah, yeah, no. some pretty wicked weed. Yeah. yeah so, and that, that again goes back to they're growing the marijuana plant to raise the THC level, so it's better stuff. Yeah. And that, that's not natural. Yeah, you, you can drive around Hillsboro and you can smell where there's medical marijuana grows. You can smell it. Outside on the street, driving by in your car with the windows up, air conditioner on. You can smell it in your car. Anyway, any other questions? Hey, one of the, the disturbing trends that Pat touched on that, that uh, Julie's going to kind of take over now is, is the connection that we're seeing between uh, these narcotic analgesics, these painkillers, and what that basically devolves to as people decide to make choices about their own medical treatment. Okay, so when we're talking about uh, opiate, opiate pain relievers, we're going to um, refer to them as painkillers. PK is, is kind of a slang term for that, and, and we've all heard the term H uh, representing heroin, and it's really not a very big leap if you think about it. Um, we know that from our surveys of young people and just anecdotally stories that we hear from law enforcement that there is a huge rise in the, the use of opiate-based pain relievers and abuse. Um, it's now the most prescribed class of medications in the United States, and adolescents and young adults who are the most vulnerable to abuse um, are receiving a pretty high percentage of those prescriptions, and that was documented back in 2009 by some researchers with NIDA and the University of Pennsylvania. Um, the uh, overdose from opiate pain relievers is the second leading cause of accidental death in the United States. It's not so much that people are, are using them to commit suicide, but it's just a, a, an overdose because they think if one or two was pretty good, then maybe a couple more is going to um, help them even more. Um, closer to home, Oregon youth um, between the ages of 18 and 25 have had more non-medical use of these pain relievers than any other state in the nation, and that's from the, the National Survey on drugs, uh, Drug Use and Health. So that, again, is, is very concerning to us. 
Uh, when Pat talked about 3.4% uh, of the high school students uh, at the school that he serves using heroin, um, if you t are talking about a school with 1,000 kids, you know, that's 34 kids that are maybe used heroin in the last 30 days. So that, to me, puts it a little bit more in perspective. Or if it's a 2,000, you know, kids in a school, you know, double that. So it's not just a statistic. These are actual young people that think that there's really no harm um, in trying these drugs out. And as we said earlier, as was mentioned earlier, um, a lot of these are in our medicine cabinets, and they're readily accessible to young people. I wanted to show you a couple of uh, pictures that you can, uh, so you can discern, you know, maybe there's something in your child's backpack that you don't recognize, and it has OC on one side and 20 on the other side. Um, if you're not cluing in that this, is, uh, that this is OxyContin, you can also go to a website that has all kinds of pills that are listed and it will help you um, figure this out. And you can just put in what is on the pill and it'll, it'll tell you what it is. And I'll give you that website here in just a second. Um, Oxycontin and Vicodin are, you know, I'm going to refer to those a lot because they're what we hear of most. Um, but as Dave said, there's all kinds of other opiate pain relievers out there that, um, that young people are abusing. And there's at least three different strengths of Vicodin. Um, when we refer to the uh, 5, 500, that just means that there's 5 uh, milligrams of hydrocodone with 500 milligrams of acetaminophen or Tylenol, if you will. So it's combined um, with another drug to just help with the pain relief. But it's the, it's the hydrocodone that's creating the, the high. Uh, this is the website, you can just Google this uh, or go to drugs.com and they have a pill identifier that will help you figure out you know, what it is that you're looking at in case you're not really sure what it might be. One indication of the extent of drug abuse that we're talking about with uh, opiate pain relievers comes from treatment admissions. Uh, and it, this particular study that um, I'm showing you the graph here is actually from a, a SAMHSA study. They uh, did a survey of metropolitan cities, the numbers of treatment admissions for various kinds of drugs. And so this compares uh, the United States with the state of Oregon and the Portland metro area, which does include uh, Beaverton and Washington County. So it seemed, um, seemed pertinent to put this in here. And what you'll notice here is that uh, for the Portland metro area, if we're looking at prescription painkillers, we're kind of even with the state. Uh, we're a little bit lower than the United States, but when we look at heroin, uh, our area is quite a bit higher in uh, uh, treatment emissions for uh, abuse of heroin. And like Dave said, most people don't just concentrate on abusing one drug. There's a lot of poly drug use. So maybe they're you know, using heroin and cocaine to bring them back up after they've had their their heroin high. So um, just another indicator that our area is experience a lot more uh, of this kind of problem. Um, in, the, in Washington County, we have an uh, interagency drug enforcement team we refer to as the WIN team. It stands for West Side Interagency Narcotics Team. And those drug investigators, as well as treatment professionals, are really seeing a surge in heroin users who first started using painkillers. Um, a lot of those begin with a legitimate prescription from their doctor or their dentist. Uh, one statistic I read the other day is that youth 18 to 25 are getting most of their prescriptions for opiates from dental procedures. And the takeaway that I get from this is that if you have a young person who's being prescribed an opiate pain reliever by your family physician, you, you might want to think long and hard and have a really um, honest conversation with your physician about whether that's really the best, uh, most appropriate medication for your child, especially if you know, they're in that age group that is, is more susceptible. And then making sure that you're keeping a really close track of, of how the drug gets dispensed and who has control over it. Um, a lot of kids are just not understanding the risk and how highly addictive these drugs are. And although treatment, drug treatment, is definitely available and very effective um, for people that need it. It's really very similar to any other chronic medical condition. If you abide by your doctor's prescription or your doctor's um, instructions to you and you follow it, if people follow the treatment that's uh, prescribed to them, there is a great chance that they're going to be able to, uh, to stay clean and sober and get their lives back under control. But 
with heroin, with other opiates, it's just so highly addictive that um, it's very easy to, to slide back into the addictive phase, and so we want to do everything we can to prevent that from happening in the first place. The thing about these drugs that makes them so addictive is just because it does affect the pleasure and reward center in our brain, um, and it pr produces a huge release of dopamine, which is that feel-good chemical that causes us to do a lot of the things that we need to do to survive. It's, it's a reward mechanism that's just set up in our brain, but these drugs definitely um, cause a huge release of this chemical, which does become very addictive. Um, and I'm going to show you the next slide that the, what we're talking about as far as um, opiate pain relievers has a very similar chemical makeup to heroin. And there's these molecule uh, drawings are, are one dimensional, but they're actually uh, in 3D in real life. And so there's a couple different areas where they are um, pretty much identical, but then there's a few areas where they differ. And so I'm just, I'm circling the areas where there is some difference, but um, as far as how the body uses these chemicals and, and how they affect the body, there's very, really very little difference. They have similar effects as Dave was describing pain relief. There's the euphoric feeling that comes from that great surge of dopamine. Um, people become drowsy, their respirations are depressed, and there is a physical addiction as well as a psychological piece. Some additional health risks that I thought were worth mentioning. Um, when we're talking about um, heroin that's available on the street, it's not really manufactured in, um, in laboratories with uh, really good quality control. So you don't know if one batch is going to be extremely pure or another batch is going to be cut with some other substance that makes it not so pure. And so users can be really caught off guard if they get a hold of a very pure amount, which could lead to an overdose um, pretty quickly. And that's often how people die of heroin overdose. Um, heroin oddly enough, is a lot cheaper than uh, these pills and say if you buy Oxycontin on the street um, or Vicodin or any other kind, it's oftentimes heroin is more, is more cheap and it's more available um, than getting pills on the black market. But we're really not talking about kids buying pills from drug dealers, right? We're talking about getting them from home and from people we know. Um, when that's not available or if that's not possible, then people do turn to drug dealers or drug dealers turn to them because it doesn't take very long for drug dealers to zero in on somebody that has a need for a particular drug. Um, having the combination of cheap drugs that are more pure um, often, almost always, leads to increased addiction and then the criminal behavior that comes with that because people have to generate the money to purchase the drug to achieve the high. This is another um, chart that shows uh, uh, admissions for drug treatment. And this specifically was from uh, Oregon in 2010, so a little more current than the first slide I showed you. And not surprisingly, marijuana is right up there. Um, what's interesting about this is uh, when I compared it to a similar chart for 2006, we'd actually dropped down quite a bit as far as uh, emissions from marijuana and stimulants and cocaine. But when we looked at heroin and other opiates, which I kind of added together just to get a combined effect for both of them, if we're going to say that they're very similar, um, it stayed about the same. So we're, we're just tracking the same with heroin as far as, or the same with opioids as far as treatment emissions, but in, in this more recent graph, we have a little bit more uh, treatment that's been necessary for other opiates, probably the prescription kind, than heroin. So they've kind of flip-flopped in, in uh, their prevalence there. Uh, another interesting thing about uh, OxyContin is that the previous formula um, was designed to be timed release. So people who had chronic, long-standing pain issues, pretty intense pain, say somebody who's a cancer patient, could take OxyContin and it would be timed release and they wouldn't have to keep taking the drug. It would be just a constant relief of pain over several hours. Well, drug addicts figured out that if they ground the pills up and then mixed them with water and injected them, then they could overcome that time-release nature. 
So um, the makers of OxyContin, Purdue Pharma, decided to come up with a different way of um, making the drug that was more resistant to crushing and actually turned into paste in instead when you mix it with water. Um, this seemed like a really great idea, right? But what um, our drug investigators have found and what we're hearing of more is that um, because OxyContin isn't really providing the, the need that people have for that particular high, they're just turning to heroin to achieve uh, what they're looking for. And this is just a, uh, a graphic that shows the old OC is the old formulation of OxyContin. OP represents the new formulation. You can just see it doesn't look like it's going to grind up quite the way that it used to. So just a little bit about heroin. Um, probably if you've watched any television, any cop shows, you know this already. But it does have some different forms that, um, that uh, we find on the street. It could be brown, tar-like substance, or a tan-colored powder. Um, there can be some uh, with these little BB-sized balls. I don't know if I can, you guys can see that. But down here, it's wrapped in cellophane, just little tiny brownish balls that are um, just a one-time use. Um, our drug team sees that fairly regularly, the tan or brownish balls of heroin. And it could be wrapped in tissue paper, tin foil, or even small balloons, as you can see here, um, latex balloons. Some of the paraphernalia, um, if somebody has gotten to the point of uh, injecting heroin, you're going to see the drug kit, the, you know, the little, it may not be something like this, it could you know, be some, any other kind of little box or zipper pouch, but it has you know, the things they need, the syringe, the tourniquet, um, an old spoon, a lighter to, to, um, to melt the stuff down, or it could be that they're um, burning it on a piece of foil and then using a hollow tube to uh, snort the fumes, which um, has a term called um, chasing the dragon, if you've heard of that before, that, that comes from heroin use. Some warning signs of use, um, and some of this um, you're going to see jives with what Dave was talking about um, in pain relievers. Uh, the person withdraws from situations they once enjoyed and they become isolated. And this can be um, any kind of um, risky behavior or, or any kind of uh, drugs that kids might be experimenting with could also cause the same kind of behavior. But Pretty much, it's gonna. This kind of a change is gonna make our antenna raise up and and just have a red flag that we need to dig a little deeper into their behavior. Um, there's a lot of sleep, a lot of sleeping, a lot of uh, disinterest in food, the paranoia that was mentioned before, and again, the big thing is the pupils to to really check the pupils and and see if they're constricted and not uh, changing even in low light situations. Um, some. Other things that you might see if a person can't get a hold of the drug, uh, you're going to see some signs of withdrawal. It could be nausea, vomiting, chills, diarrhea, body aches, extreme restlessness, and the person really looks and feels sick. Also, want to keep in mind signs of overdose because, as I said, you know the quality control on you know the product isn't there. So there could be a, a wide variety of purity. Um, that people are using. So if they've taken too much, you're going to see um, the blue lips, skin, and fingernails. They're going to have cold and clammy skin, uh, a weak pulse, maybe labored breathing, and the breathing is uh, definitely going to slow down if they're in distress. They could even go unconscious, and at this point, you know, you need to be calling 911 if you can't rouse them. It's going to be different than being on the nod where they can still converse with you, but in this case, uh, they're really not able to. So now you know all the, the, the bad stuff. So what can we do to really combat this in our community and make sure that our kids stay safer? Well, if we look at the different roles that um, we have in the community and the different uh, options that we have, we can really look to law enforcement. We have a, a really good drug enforcement team that I mentioned before that they're continuing to um, work on this problem, not just heroin trafficking, but also diversion of prescription drugs. Um, and our WIN team has a lot of uh, other partnerships, both state uh, law enforcement and federal, that work really hard together and they do a really good job of 
targeting the, the drug traffickers and trying to take them, take them out, get them uh, uh, to justice. But if we're going to talk about how we can intervene for people that are in crisis, there are also a lot of resources available within our own community. Um, we have a crisis line, we have Oregon Partnership, and a lot of local drug treatment providers. Um, and then we have a lot of prevention efforts that are going on simultaneously. And the Hay Coalition that sponsored this um, evening for us tonight, other community coalitions such as Beaverton Together, Tiger Turns the Tide, uh, all across Washington County are, are working on these problems. Um, anything we can do to get the word out about the drug turn-in events, and you can see the, the posters up here about so the one coming up this Saturday. It's nationwide from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And Hillsborough Police Department, just up the street, they're a good place to drop drugs off, as well as Aloha High School. Um, on that Saturday. Um, these drop boxes that M Michelle mentioned, the Sheriff's Office ha has one in the lobby now, and uh, many other police agencies within Washington County have that service as well. Um, just making sure that we do everything we can to protect the drugs that, that we want to make sure don't get in the hands of our young ones and talking to our kids about um, the dangers that they might face and the reasons why it's not okay to share prescriptions and to experiment with prescription drugs. Um, Oregon does have a fairly new um, prescription drug monitoring program that pharmacies are all on a database so they can keep track of individuals and their physicians and it's really a way to improve patient care as well as keep track of people that are doctor shopping and getting prescriptions just for the purpose of maybe selling them or, or um, misusing them in some way. And then a little bit more, um, yeah, close to home. <laughs> We thought, you know, let's just be honest about it. We, we really want everybody to, to do what they can do, and maybe people are struggling and not really sure what that might be. And so we have a few things, too, to, to talk about. Um, Pat has done some research on this, and, and we're going to talk together about some smart things that families can do to ensure that their kids stay safe. So before you guys get going, can I throw a couple more things out there? About three weeks ago, the LA Times did, a re did some research and they found out that there's more than 100 people every day that are dying from prescription drug overdoses, not necessarily intentional. The thing that really caught my attention is that that's more people than are being killed every day in car accidents. I just want to throw that out there. Well, that's a good point and we even have a, a handout that has um, a similar article on that. So, smart moves. This is easy stuff, really. You can really boil it down. So, um, what's in your medicine cabinet? Think about what you got at home, what's in there. Okay, if you got any vitamin laying around, what are you taking for this, what are you taking for that? Know what's in there, especially if you've got kids. Um, make a list of them and, and monitor the quantities, especially if you're talking about the beef beer. Um, you know, got an ongoing refill prescription of Vicodin or Oxycodone. Keep track of what's going on with those pills. Absolutely. Educating your friends and relatives, especially maybe elderly relatives. We all know that, you know, as people age, they tend to take a lot more medication, and a lot of uh, older folks tend to hang on to their meds a lot longer, and young people are, are cluing into that, and they're going into the medicine cabinets at Grandma's house, and they're, they're seeing what they can find in there to, to get high. So encouraging them to be aware of this as well. Control the access. Take control. If, if your teen is prescribed medication, you dose it. You give them what they need when they need it. Don't allow them to take control over it. You might think they're the most responsible kid in the entire world, but I got to tell you something, folks. This stuff makes you feel pretty good. It does, and it has a purpose. And once that per once the need for that's over, those things need to go away, and it needs to be used responsibly and safely. And make it clear that meds are not to be shared. How many times you said, oh, I need a headache, and it takes from your bike. Oh, yeah, sure, go ahead. That, and all you're doing is telling your kid it's okay. And that's something that we really got to watch for. You know, I love to talk to teenagers, and, and teenagers using these drugs, all they hear about is the good stuff. Marijuana makes you feel good, it makes me happy, blah, blah, blah. Dave just told you, marijuana immediately raises your, your blood pressure, your heart rate, your body temperature. 
right? Body temperature remains fairly normal, but okay. pulse and blood pressure definitely go way up. So both. I'm 52, I'm trying to keep my blood pressure down. <laughs> okay. And modeling really is the key here, because if we're telling our kids one thing, but we're you know recycling medications and hanging on to them in case we might need them in the future, we're really not setting a very good example. So that's something to keep in mind. And kids will call you on it. You know, They, they don't appreciate being told one thing and, and mom and dad doing another thing. Well, I'll tell you one quick one here. I, I was a DARE instructor, drug abuse resistance education. You remember that one? No, Mr. Callaway does, I think. And one of the big beefs parents have in the dare is I would stand in front of the class and say, don't drink alcohol, don't use marijuana, don't smoke cigarettes. So they'd go home and when their folks started you know, smoking like that with cigarettes going off, they said, you shouldn't do that. His parents would just be incensed about that. Well, the kids are right. The kids were getting the message home with the parents. It wasn't the other way around. It was great. We want to make sure that we're creating that safe environment and removing our prescription and over-the-counter drugs from the medicine cabinet if they're not being used um, and keep keep them safe and secure. And Michelle has a really good um, example of a way to store medication safely and you can actually have access to uh, that tonight. I'll model if you want to. Yeah, I'll wait. <laughs> Go. Um, we have these, Hay has these available. They're 20 bucks, they fit 12 prescription pill bottles, normal size, they're great. I now have one at home. I have an 18 month old and we, and what is curious to me that we try to protect our kids when they're little, but we don't think about it when they're teenagers, when it's almost that they need more protection. So these are awesome. I'm not naive, I know that if they want to get into it, they will, but you will know because you have it locked up. And it's really simple, it's three locks. We have them for those at home in TV land. Um, you can go to haytogether.org and there um, you can order one from our website as well. And just really quickly before we go into Q&A too, I wanted to say that on our website, for those of you who have family members in other parts of Oregon, um, we have created a map that shows permanent drop-off locations for prescription drugs throughout the year. And it's all over Oregon. So you can go and find, if you know somebody in Klamath Falls or if you have family in Grants Pass, that you can tell them, this is where you can go drop off your drugs and I encourage you to do it. And these make excellent Christmas gifts to Hanukkah. <laughs> it, it all goes back to that, envir that environment that we want to be safe for our kids. And let you know, the rest of the relatives and friends know what you're doing and why, because they may want to get their own uh, drug lock box, but you definitely want them to reinforce the message um, when kids are at their house. So if you're not using, get rid of it. If, if your toothache's gone and you still got five bikes in left, get rid of it. Number of ways to do that, again, the drop off coming up, coming up. Um, if there's a direction on the label for disposing of medication, follow that. Don't flush it down the toilet. The, the DEA, the um, Drug Enforcement Administration, said, you know, it's probably not a lot of um, risk in that, but just don't do it just in case. So they just say, if you can't get rid of it any other way, just mix it with your kitty litter or your coffee grounds or some trash that it's not going to be recognized in, seal it in a plastic bag and throw it away. And one of the problems with flushing the medication is that it does get into the water system and there have been a lot of tests on our water that shows that we have some trace amounts of these drugs that I don't really want to be drinking, so. Removing your personal information, if you're going to throw out the prescription bottle, you know, take a Sharpie pen and black that out. Don't share your meds, like we talked about, and then take advantage of those drug turn-ins. Okay, this is a big one. Watch your kids. Just keep an eye on them. Uh, if you notice changes in behavior, changes, drastic changes in weight, drastic changes in grades, in attendance in school, in attitude about school. Uh, marijuana is a big one here, going back to, to the weed thing. Marijuana causes apathy. Kids just don't care. And the student you used to have that was a 3-5, four-point student is now a 2-2 two -two student. Um, it's uh, easy for us as when we work in high school for quite a bit, spend about five weeks with kids in school and you're able to point to the kids who are using it. And you, you can just tell. 
and you can go to an image and we just go through it. Um, so you've got to got to watch your team. When we talk about the pill identification, if you're going through your kid's backpack and there's a handful of white pills in there, it ought to throw up a red flag. You ought to be thinking, and I gotta go to some place for help. Julie mentioned a lot of those places. One of the best places to go, especially in Hillsboro, is to the schools. Every school in Hillsboro has a school resource officer. We're not out to bust you. It's not our job to bust, you know, you phrase that. That's his job to bust. Okay? I'm a good cop. <laughs> Yes, my homeostasis is uh, meat donuts. No, but, but it's important to know where your resources are and get to know your school administrators, get to know your school counselors and who's working with your kids at the school so you have somebody to go to and somebody to ask about. I can't tell you how many kids a week just come into my office and sit down and talk and they're spelling their guts about stuff. So and so doing this, so and so doing that. Kid popped in the other day, opened my door, says, uh, just want to let you know that Susie Jones is going to get, uh, you know what, beat out of her at lunch. You might want to check into that. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So, but that's all good stuff. Kids do the same thing with, with drugs at school. So and so's got weed. Thanks. One other thing you might be aware of, if you do get a handful of pills and it's the middle of the night, it's not when there's someone available at the school, you can actually call poison control and give them that information and they'll be able to tell you exactly what the drug is and what the dosage is. They're also gonna ask you if somebody's in the medical emergency and if they need to have a call 911, but just tell them, hey, I found these pills, I need to know what they are. And they're very quick and they're extremely knowledgeable and things like that. Gotta to talk to your kids. I remember the, I don't remember the days, but I remember where I was the first time my dad told me about marijuana. He said, I don't want you smoking weed. We were, we were honest to God, we were driving west when I grew up in Montana, 4th Street at Hickory. Driving west in the 57 Plymouth, my dad, had, and he starts talking to me about using weed. Yeah, whatever, dad, I'm good. But, but it stuck with me. And, it, you know, I don't know, 40 years later, I'm going, wow, that's pretty powerful. Just that message. You automatically now have a way to get to your kids. Yeah, hey, what's this presentation that? This is what the cops and the people are talking about. If you're watching this on TV, the same thing. Grab your kid, get him in the living room with you, watching this TV show on TV, so you can engage in the conversation and get him going. That's all you need, just that little in, to let them know that you're taking control, that you know what's going on, and that you're able to sit down and chat. That's huge. That's huge. Some, Lots some, more resources, good. Some online resources uh, that are great you want to do a little bit more research and get some more uh, information under your belt, uh, the antidrug.com, timetotalk.org, and I won't read them for you, but um, the Smart Moves, Smart Choices website is probably one of the best that I've seen on this topic, and there's a lot of really great information for youth, for parents, for educators. Um, it's a great resource, so I'd highly recommend that one. These are great. If you have any questions, uh Dave, can you reach the police department? The easiest place to get me is at Century High School. Just say, hey, you want to talk to the cop? Julie at the Sheriff's Office. Uh, the juvenile department has some great resources, and thank you very much. Awesome. But, but there's all kinds of people around, and we're easy to find. And there's a lot of stuff out there to help you out with this. Can I add one more thing? No, I we're good. <laughs> Thank you. I have canned speeches that I give on certain types of calls. Here's my favorite parenting speech, and I don't like being a hypocrite. This is what I do with my own kids. As a parent, your job is not to be their buddy. Your job is not to be their friend. This is not a popularity contest. Your job is to parent your child. Use some of these resources. Don't be afraid. You can't be afraid of talking to your kids about anything. All right, the worst thing that can happen is you're going to look silly to your kid. Guess what? It's already happened. It's going to continue to happen throughout your life. Accept it, own it, and get this done. Let your kids know that you know what's going on. Um, another place that we like is the Urban Dictionary, because you'll hear them talk about things. You'll hear things in music, and you'll be like, what's that? And you find out, oh, this really cool song about the G6 is really about mixing Robitussin and, and champagne and getting high. Oh wow, maybe we shouldn't be all dancing to that song as a family, you know, on our family get together night because it may be sending a wrong message. Model the behavior that you want your kids to display. You may have to give some things up, but for the safety of your kids, don't be afraid. Do it.